I've got a first time guest on the show today and she believes that money and happiness are connected, but not the way you think. Melissa Leung is here and she's gonna explain how money, life and happiness all fit together starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. <clears throat> Melissa Leung, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, thank you. Okay, we just we just started. Yeah. That's the way we go. Jump right in. I'm in. Now, you have written for the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, a bunch of other places, TV, the whole bit. The I first became aware of your work, I think, with either Financial Post or National Post. Mm-hmm. I don't know who it was. And I actually, you know, pulled up the article. This was, I think, the height of your journalistic career here. January 14th, 2013. Should credit cards be called debt cards? And you actually quoted me and you quoted Ted Michaelis in here. That was the highlight so of my career. That's kind of what I right figured. There. So, so there you go. That's why, uh, you know, it took us uh, seven years to get you on here. But, <laughs> but here we are. So first question before we talk about the book. Who is Wynn Channing? Oh, that is a secret. Okay. I'm just kidding. It's my alter ego. I uh, delved into young adult paranormal fiction and I created and, a And pen. that's what all my financial guests do <laughs> on the show here. Yeah. Young adult paranormal fiction. That's right. I was also teaching salsa dancing at the time. So As I had one would many do. identities. As one would do. So Wynn Channing is uh, a pen name that I created that's based on my so-called stripper's name, mm-hmm. which is your middle name and the street name that you grew up on. Et voila. And I grew up on Main Street, so it wouldn't wouldn't be very interesting. No, for me. try the Douglas Main. What's your middle name? Douglas. I go, oh, see, okay. My, my your pet le- name. Your first pet name. Um, the first uh, the the first uh, pet you ever had. Bilbo. Bilbo Main. Hmm. Sexy. There we go. So, <laughs> and that's the show. Thank you very much, all for for watching. That that's okay. So there you go. So I I don't get too many guests on the show who have that that background. But okay, let's talk money then, because you have written a book. It's right here. Uh, happy go money, spend smart, save right and enjoy life. Uh, this is Jessica Albert's work. I assume on the front cover here, is it? Yes, it is. So, and these are very talented. Uh, I've, I've heard many stories. These <laughs> are bubble designer. gums, are they? Or uh, It's candy, little candy. tiny candy. And because she is so meticulous and so hardworking, she actually with tweezers, painstakingly moved all the candy to spell out happy go money on the cover of the oh, book. Oh, it's actually spelled. Oh, my, that is, that is so It's cool. not used with graphics. It's not computer generated. That's candy. That is, that is Carefully so Carefully. Cool. So if that isn't the best around. cover graphic that anyone has ever seen, the, on my book, I spent like thousands of thousands of hours and we just had to put the words on it. We couldn't figure <laughs> anything out. So I will have to talk to Jessica next time. So, I've read this book twice now. I read it, I don't know, in sometime in 2019 when it came out. And then over the last week, I read it again. And I've read a lot of financial you know, books because that's what I do. I'm mm-hmm. sure you've Me read too. lots of them yourself. And most of them I read and I go, okay, that's pretty good. They talked about saving. They talked about investing. They talked about what a TFSA is, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you, you hit all that stuff here too. But then after I'd read it, I'm still thinking about it. Like there's stuff in your, in your head that, and I don't know if it's some of the stories you told in mm. there or, and they weren't really stories. They were anecdotes. They were just sort of, you know, you'd throw stuff in there. Right. So, you know, I, uh, I had a baby and then this thing happened and the kid was pooping and then I, this <laughs> happened and, and it's. That just describes my every day, Doug. And that's what I'm thinking, right? And so it all kind of linked together and it, you know, like you kind of can't get it out of your brain. Is that what you were going oh, for? Oh, I like that, that you said that. It, but it's true. It's true. Well, you know what? I've spent my entire career as a journalist mostly and as a, a author and a writer. And so my, um, my life's work is creating stories that are meaningful to other people. And money is just a collection. Money is about the stories that you create for your life. So you use money to create the story of your wedding and the birth of your baby and all these wonderful milestones, this narrative that makes up your life. And so when we break dollar uh, money into down into dollars and cents, yes, that's important to do. But really how we all connect over money is that we use it to try to create this fulfilling existence. And so by telling stories that I think are meaningful to me, I hope that others relate to those stories. Um, and not even just the stories, my stories, but stories of, you know, research that I've found and, and other things and uh, that I've come across that that um, really resonated with me. Well, and there's a ton of research in here because you're, you know, constantly referring to this study, that study, mm. whatever. And so would you agree then that we create our own reality? Oh, yes, I do. And that's, 
I, I don't know, that's kind of the subtext I get out of this, this book that, okay, so here's the way you're thinking about it. Here's, mm-hmm. you know, perhaps a different perspective on that same thing. Yes. Um, and if you can kind of twist the way you're thinking, then you're actually changing your reality, which I guess is why you wrote vampire fiction or whatever. <laughs> that it. was it's, my it's, hobby. It's exactly it's, it's the same fun. thing. And it has to do with money. You know, vampires live forever. You need a lot of money for that. I did not know that actually. So that's because I thought you could stick something in their heart or something and that was it. So Happy Go Money, What? where does that title come from? That title is actually the uh, brainchild of Bruce Celery. Well, who was, was the I, I just, uh, host of I just saw the him. fabulous Moolala podcast? I just podcast was on that and... show this week. So and so, okay, what does it mean? What? It's not happy about money. It's not money makes you happy. It's happy go money. Explain that. Happy. It's sort of a play. When I was talking to Bruce about it, we were sort of brainstorming, and he's a wonderful, wonderful friend and mentor to me. And so, uh, I love his his philosophy as well, which is, you know, yes, money is a tool. You need it to uh, give you the life that you want, but you just have to make sure that you know what in life actually makes you happy. And so happy-go-lucky is this feeling of, you know what, things are going to work out. Things are good. I got things taken care of. Uh, You know, I'm not stressing about money because I have already done the work to figure out, okay, Hmm. this is what I value. Let me allocate my resources to that. So if I want to run a marathon, put all the work in, and then the marathon becomes pretty easy because you put the work in up front. It's kind of the the same concept, I would think. Now, you said here, money and happiness are connected, but not in the way we think. So let's that's, unpack that. That's, let's unpack that because that's right <laughs> in the introduction. What like uh, money and happiness connected? Okay, of course they're connected. The more money you have, the the happier you are. Boom. End of discussion. Yes, because you need to cover your you need to cover your basic necessities. Mm -hmm. And so once your food, uh, you don't have to worry about um, where you're going to live. You want to eat and sleep indoors. A certain amount of money, yes, is your goal. It's what will make you happier. It's what what will fuel your future goals. You know, you have to have money for future self. Um, But interestingly, according to the research, there have been many numbers trotted out over the years when it comes to research. Some of those, the most recent numbers are $95,000 US pre-tax per single family household. That's the optimal amount of money you need to be satisfied with your life in terms of a judgment. You judge your life to be, yeah, that's pretty good. When it comes to day-to-day happiness, basically how you feel right now talking to me, hopefully happily, that number is between sixty dollars and $75,000 US. The interesting thing about the research is that once you go over those thresholds, it's actually associated with a decrease in happiness. Mm. So I think people think, whoa, I'm just going to make more and more money. I'm going to take the job that that pays more. I am going to make all these decisions that will bring me more money because it's going to make me happier. But that's obviously not necessarily the case. I mean, those figures are averages. Uh, people can be optimally happy with a lot less and some people need a little bit more. And, and so why is that? So I, I get what you're saying. If I've paid my rent, bought my groceries, you know, I've got bus fare. Okay, I'm good. I don't have to, I, I'm like, I'm really freaking out if I can't do that. But once I get to a certain level, is it because I have to do so much more to get to the next level? Like if I have to work 80 hours a week to go from, I don't know, 100 grand to 200 grand, then it's just not worth it. Is that the the concept there? Um, there are a number of factors that, that, is associated with the decrease in happiness once you make a certain amount. First of all, you, you like you said, you could be making more money, but that might involve more hours. More hours means more work and less time with your family and less time doing the things that you actually care about. It's more stressful. You're also um, getting into a situation where you're competing more with other people. Mm-hmm. And right now, all we do is look on our phones and see what everyone else is doing. And you feel dissatisfied with your own life based on your peers. That's normal. We're human. Yeah. We look at our neighbors and we say, whoa, that guy won a million dollars. I didn't win a million dollars, but they have a new car. Maybe I should buy a new car. It's totally irrational. But there are studies that show that if you are living beside somebody who has won money, you are more likely to go bankrupt. That's yeah, just, you, you talk about that. Yes, in the book that's here. just it's bizarre yep. fact that we look around us and say we base our happiness on others. The other thing is we start to focus on material goods. You have more money, you might get a raise, but you're spending it on stuff. And according to research, stuff really doesn't make you more satisfied or make you feel happier on a more organic level. And that's why you say in the book, money makes people weird. 
<laughs> do I say that? I think you say I that. I think it in, does. In fact, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm misquoting, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, if you're that's if in you're. The book I here, totally so. would say that because I believe that it yeah. does make people weird. People act strange. You ask someone how much money they make, they freak out. I mean, this generation is a lot more open about talking about how much money they make, and I think that conversation is great. But it's uh, what I'm saying that people freak out about money is that they find it so stressful and they attach it to all these things, such as uh, my pride, um, what it means as a person. You know, we attach our self worth to money and that's weird because it's yeah. just because it's just money yeah m- money is a tool obviously it's it, it's it's nothing we more give than it that. meaning we give it meaning we give well, it all sorts of strange which is kind of what we said meaning. at the top that we're creating our own reality we're using the the money to do that so okay in terms of practical advice then what you're saying is i shouldn't be focused on trying to make every last dollar because the studies show that's not going to make you happier it's just going to make you nuts what then should I be focusing on? Is it like, okay, get to a certain limit and then whatever extra money I've got, I should be, you know, trading that for time. It's better to be spending time with family than like, what, what's, the, think, what's the big picture? I think, you know, when message? they ask you in your career, what's your five-year plan? And you think, what? I don't want to think that far down. What the, why am I? It's to take a step back and have a bigger picture look. And so one of the exercises that you can do uh, is, the second one I'm going to say is identify your habits. But the first one I'm going to talk about is identifying the things that, that give you the most meaning, that fuel you. So for example, if you think, you know what, my top five, uh, the top five most valuable things in my life, the things that give me the most joy, my family, number one, two, uh, being generous, number three, maybe creativity, um, finding creative outlets, uh, four, my health. So if those are the things that you value most, then you should be allocating your time, your money to those things if you're looking to be happier right? So when, for example, I was uh, actively trying to save money for a specific goal and then, you know, it'd be end of the day and I'm tired and my baby's screaming and my son and my husband are hungry and I think I'm just going to grab my phone and I'm going to just skip the dishes. I'm just going to order some food in. I thought, okay, I could spend $50 on this, but I've already talked about how important seeing my parents is and I really should be saving my money so that I could buy a plane ticket, you know, nine months from now so I can go and visit them because that is what is important. Not all these other things that I really probably could just pop something in the microwave right now. And those are important things longer term as opposed to what's important five minutes from now. Sure. But we're always living in five minutes from now, right? It's I'm hungry now. I'm not thinking about a trip I'm going to take in nine months. So trying to be happier with your money is trying to figure out where you should be allocating your money. Because as you know, it's all about choices. And sometimes we get caught up in the um, here and the now, and we also get caught up with our habits. And so one of the things that I I talk about in the book too is trying to identify what your money habits are. If you think of the last three unplanned purchases you made, what were you feeling before you made them? Why did you make them? Often we use uh, purchasing and money as a way to fill our voids. And so some of those voids are you feeling crappy, you're feeling um, stressed and you use money and spending as a way to medicate yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you're anxious, when you're feeling nervous, when you think, oh man, I had the crappiest day at work. You know what? I deserve a pick me up. And you go when you do this thing or you do it out of boredom. Boredom is a state of stress. And so you're bored, you're on your phone. Hey, you have one click buy on Amazon and you do that. Um, And the other one is not feeling a sense of self-worth. And you think, if I buy this, my friends will value me. I got to pick up the check. I need to buy this outfit because tomorrow I have a job interview. And if I wear it, I'm going to feel successful. And this is what I need. Or I need this brand new outfit because there was a study on the radio that said that people judge you based on your outfit. And if you don't have a good outfit for the gym, you won't go to the gym. And I need to go to the gym. So you make all of these excuses in your head. And so figuring out if you buy because you're feeling anxious, then maybe one thing that you should try to pay more attention to is trying to fill that void, trying to deal with the anxiety versus giving yourself a budget. The budget will help, but it doesn't fix the actual problem. So I don't know about you or I don't know about the clients that, that you've that you've run into over the years, but um, I, have you run into people where you, you know, give them all the tools, but then something will happen in their life that they're stressed about, that they're, you know, uh, some sort of ma- major change. And then the habits they fall back on, such as overspending, getting back into debt, Happens again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the vast majority of people who come to see us are under a lot of stress. And a lot of the stress is, it's not of their doing. I mean, they they got sick, they lost their job, they got right. divorced, something happened. And as a result, that has caused the, the stress. But you're right. The money becomes a really easy way in the short term to deal with it. 
So your example of, well, I'll order in instead of, you know, actually going to the grocery store and cooking something, it becomes a, a quick fix to it. And things like, okay, and, and, and the, the way you described it with the clothing, okay, and then you, you and I are both dressed very well today. If oh, I thank do, you. Do, do say so myself. <laughs> um, the shirt was clean, so that's why I'm wearing it. Um, well, there are times when I do need to, to buy an outfit, right? I am going for a job interview and I can't really show up in a ripped shirt. I, I do need the, the shirt. So what you're saying is you got to step back and look at the reasons you're doing it. Like how, how do I decide if I do, should be buying that shirt then or not? So I think that I am, I am sleep deprived. I have a baby. My four-year-old's waking up with night terrors. I, um, this morning was a gong show of trying to get here on time and, and rushing out and grabbing whatever I could find to wear. So to require me to take on the responsibility of looking at every single thing I buy and saying, hmm, is this a very smart use of my money? That's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And so something that I talk about in my book is you do have to spend some time before doing some planning where you plan what is available, where you plan, um, okay, I have done a budget. I know what money is coming in. I know what money goes out to my fixed expenses or to pay my bills to make sure my lights stay on. And maybe I can carve out some money because if you don't have some money for your enjoyment, for buying a shirt that you need, uh, it's like a crash diet. It's like one of those, you know, extreme diets where you just, ah, you, yeah. you give up and you go crazy. So you do need to figure out, okay, I'm okay with this amount of money. I'm going to siphon it out. I'm going to put it in a separate account associated with maybe a, a you know, a, a no fee debit card so that I can use this. If there's money in this account, I can buy this shirt. So it's a little bit of planning to allow yourself to spend on the things that you care about. Yeah. And so you're talking kind of a systems versus goals type thing that, you know, my system is I think through things in advance. I've got a, a big picture of where I'm going so that when the day to day decisions come up, I can fall back on the fact that, OK, that money is set aside for something in the future. Right. And therefore, I'm less tempted to, to to buy that thing today. If I spend I mean, you can only spend a loony once. That's how, how it works. Right. And so if I spend it on this thing, I can't spend it on that thing. And so I've really got to be looking at, like you say, what's really important Right. To me. And I've also put money in a separate account. So is there money in that account? Yes. Then I will order the $50 Chinese food, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yep. because I've also spent some time thinking about, okay, well, I do need to pay down this debt. So automatically money is coming out of this account to go in to debt repayment. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to think, well, I'm not going to pay down my debt this month because I really want to do this other thing. Mm -hmm. And also you brought up this really important point that I hope we'll get back to, which is the people fall into money troubles, not because they don't know the RRSP deadline, not because they don't know the rules of the TFSA withdrawals, but because they run into life. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I went on the journey of writing this book is because life happened to me, mm -hmm. very something very serious that taught me some lessons that I continue to use today uh, and that I wanted to share with other people so that they don't have to suffer as much. Yeah. And there's lots of good stuff in the book. And that's why I say it, it rattles around in your head after you, after you read it. It's like, oh, okay, that, but, but you're right. The, the biggest thing that happens in life is life. Stuff happens and people come in to see me and we're recording this in our, our Osho office. We've never, never recorded anything here before. Oh. You're, you're the, the first guest here. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe we'll never have another guest again. That may be it. We'll, this is we'll, my this, place. This is your, your place, your studio. <laughs> so it's when they come in to see me, I mean, they've got debt and we're going to talk about debt because you mentioned that word. Um, and the only way you can have debt is if things were better in the past. You had to qualify for it. You, the bank had to say, oh, you're earning enough money, you're good. And now I've got more debt than I can handle. Well, things are not as good as they were. That's what debt is. It's, a, again, a, a karma thing, I think, too. Now, chapter 23, mm -hmm. which you remember well, debt, the big killjoy. That's the, yep. the title of the chapter. And of course, I must confess, when I read a personal finance book, the first thing I do is look at the con the table of con. Okay, where's the chapter on debt? I always <laughs> start there. So I, I'm the only person who started in chapter 23 in your book. When it comes, I'm quoting here, when it comes to money and happiness, there is no lesson that I can impart that will be more important than this one. The biggest happiness killer is debt. 
Hmm. And so then you, again, as you do, quote some st- surveys and studies and whatnot. Um, you know, problems with your bank, or your boss, rank number 36. Your spouse cheating on you was number 14. The death of a close friend, number 13th biggest stressor. Divorce, number nine. Homelessness, number six. Getting into debt, number five on the Isn't that list amazing? of that, that's like stunning. Getting into debt beyond means of repayment ranks more stressful, in and in according to a survey, uh, of life's most stressful events than being homeless or divorced or and a death of a close friend. I mean that, that that is that is stunning. Now that doesn't shock me at all because people <laughs> sit course, here and it's like course. they're you know is the phone going to ring? What's going to happen? Right. What like it, it it is totally all consuming and there's no point in saving money when I've got all this debt because that's a much more. I mean my wages are going to be garnished next week. I'm not worried about my retirement ten years down right. the road. So what is you know, what are your thoughts on debt then? Is it as simple as, okay, that's got to be your priority or is it, you know, so so how do you balance this thing? I've got these, you know, bigger picture goals. I want to go visit my parents. I want to do these other things, but then I've also got this debt as well, which is an added complication. How can you juggle all those things? I think it really depends on what kind of debt you have, right? I mean, when people come in to see you, they have various kinds of debt. And I mean, when you, I'm not, when I say prioritize debt, I mean, it's looking at the types of debts you have. If your wages are going to be garnished the, you know, next week, then yeah, that is very different from somebody coming in and saying, you know, I have a couple thousand dollars on my credit card. I need some help getting it down. Then you can create a different kind of plan. Yeah, and right? obviously the, the vast majority of people in Canada, I mean, everybody has debt. Yes. And the vast majority of people, okay, it is a manageable amount of debt. It's a mortgage. I'm going to pay it off. I've got some money on, on some credit cards and, and whatnot. If you have a manageable amount of debt, if you have a lo- if you have large amounts of credit card debt and, you, and that is creating stress in your life, then... Yes, allocate all of your resources to get down that high interest credit card debt, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think savings is a habit. And I think putting a little bit of money aside, if you can, while paying down your credit card debt is important for the reason that putting some money aside will actually also help you not get into further debt if something happens. When something happens and you have a little bit of money, a little bit of cash on the side as your emergency fund, it will prevent you from running to your credit card, which is already probably in use. Uh, and it, it's, it, I'm talking about psychology too. The idea that putting more money in your credit card when you run into trouble is, as you know, it can be tremendously defeating. It can, mm-hmm. and it can put people um, in a state of, of, it can just take away all of your motivation. Yeah, you and know? That, it's interesting because we have a slightly different perspective on that. I'm an accountant. So to me, it's all numbers. Numbers, 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 yes, numbers. I get and, that too. And that can be kind of dangerous because when I look at it, I go, well, you got a credit card that has a 20% interest rate. Yes. You can put some money in your savings Why account. Why would you do that? And earn zero. Yes. So from a math point of view, there's no. it's a no-brainer. And I agree with you. From a math point of view, yes, do that. But- I'm talking about behavioral finance. Mm -hmm. People don't always do, how should I say this? Sometimes the most effective thing for someone is not always to follow the math. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and and you may have seen this research too, sometimes it actually makes, even though it doesn't make any mathematical sense, sometimes it's really great for somebody to choose to pay down the the smallest Mm -hmm. debt first. Whatever they call it, debt. um, Debt snowball. There you go. And it doesn't make any sense when it comes to math. You're paying more in interest over time, but it just gives people that feeling of, look what I'm doing. I'm going to do more of this great thing that I'm doing. And as you know, personal finance is about your own motivation, your own sense of responsibility, and your own choices. So if that makes you feel better about doing what you're doing, do that. Yeah. And I guess, and this is where, you know, I have to consciously say to myself, okay, let's look at the big picture here because it's not just math, but it's also not just, well, do whatever makes you feel good. Okay. Well, no, no. you, you, you got to look at- <laughs> That's at how we got to the mess in the exactly, first place. <laughs> absolutely right. So you got to look at both factors, but you're right. There are people, okay, I owe 200 bucks on that, you know, old credit card. And even though the interest rate is still fairly low- you know what, just get it paid off now and then it's done. It's one more off my checklist. Instead of having five debts, I've only got four. So even though the math may not make sense, get it done, Human wipe it off. Human love checking off that checklist. Yep. We just like it. And so there's some some behavioral studies that show that if you have a bunch of goals, actually put the first goal you should make should be half done already so that you can mm. check it off sooner. 
So make it a really easy, a, a clear yep. win right off the bat. Yep. Or smaller goals. Break a big goal up into tiny, tiny, tiny goals so you can check more of them off. It feels great and it keeps you on track. So give me an example of a really tiny goal that we can all set and, and accomplish it today. So like, you know, I mean, is it something as simple as, well, I want to put 10 bucks in the bank? Is yep. that a, that would be a small goal. Yes. I, I'm going to go in my wallet right now and every blue bill that I see, I'm going to put in an envelope. I'm going to start my Christmas fund. I'm going to save some money for Christmas shopping this year. And it's going to start right now. Every blue bill that I see. What, which bills are blue? <laughs> it's a five. A five, a five. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Are you not so, seeing those? Are they no, too I'm, big or is I'm, it a cashless society I'm, in your household? It's a cashless household? society. Okay. It's a cashless society. I'm trying to think, when, yeah, when do you use bills anymore? Okay, well, how about this? Then uh, download your bank's app. Mm -hmm. Just put it on your phone so that it's there and it's on your home screen on the front page. And you're going to make a point that every week, maybe I'll open it and see what my balance is. Because so many of us don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I see that all the time. People come in here. So tell me about your debts. And they go, well, I think I owe about... I have no idea. Yeah. Right. And they, they're like, we'll talk to them on the phone. They'll call in. They'll say, yeah, I think I owe about 30000 or something. And by the time they come in and we add it all up, well, it's actually 62000 When it comes to stressful things, what do we do? I mean, right? It's yeah. fight, flight, ignore. or you just hide. Yep. You hide. When things are stressful, it's just easier to ignore them. And because our brain, we feel... Uh, we've ignored something and then it's given us immediate satisfaction because we're not stressed. It yeah. just perpetuates. And the more you ignore it, the bigger it's the problem gets. It's not making it any better. That's for sure. Yes. So in the book, you have the term financial winter. So mm -hmm. what advice do you have for people to prepare for a financial winter? And, and I mean, by financial winter, you're talking about, well, something not great happening in the future. Is that what right. you, how would you define that? And, and I would say that every single one of us is going to have something, some hiccup along the road. People don't like to think about that. And the, the fact that you even just said that, people listening are going to think, oh, yeah, but that sucks and it's not going to happen to me. Because we actually tend to think that whatever's happening to us right now, the good times, the good times will last mm -hmm. longer than they do. And it's the same thing when bad times happen. We actually think the bad is going to last longer than it does. So we... We know rationally that something is coming around the corner, whether that's your roof leaking or a raccoon going up there and tearing all the shingles off or your furnace breaking or you getting into a car accident, your cat eats dental floss and it needs surgery and it's $3,000. Yes, these things are going to happen, but we don't think it's going to happen to us mm -hmm. or we just don't put the time in to prepare for them. And so I have... Because I write about money, I tend to be more conservative. Uh, I tend to be a planner when it comes to my finances. And so before my husband and I got married, I thought, you know, we're going to have a marriage, not a wedding. This is going to be like, how do you want to start this life together? So do we want to go into debt for the wedding? No, we're going to pay off the wedding. I'm not going to go to my honeymoon. We're not going to go on a honeymoon because I don't want to go further into debt. Um... We need disability insurance in case one of us can't work, especially because my husband's self-employed. That's important. We need to pool all of our savings to make some sort of emergency fund. I wanted to make sure that if anything came our way, uh, I thought that thing was going to be a baby. So I thought that we were going to plan our life so that, hey, I want to stay at home for a few years. Let's make sure that we can afford this new house that we're buying on one income. So we bought the sliver of a townhouse in the suburbs, really far away from downtown, which I did not want. And the rooms were triangular shaped. Like you can't even put a bed in there. Like why am I buying this house that doesn't have a perfect kitchen with an island for entertaining? But it was the house that I could afford on one income. So we made the sacrifices to do just that. And the winter that came, my financial winter, which was very sudden and fast and unexpected, is that I married the happiest man in Canada. And a couple months after our wedding, he became just broken by depression and anxiety, suicidal ideation. And very quickly, all of these choices that I made that I thought were for preparing for a life of having a family, it became the house and the, uh, I guess, the financial house that I had built that was going to weather the storm because he could not work, but we had insurance. Um, we had savings because treatment centers are tens of thousands of dollars. And luckily he didn't need it at that time, but we had it so that we could focus on what matters. And if we hadn't had our ducks in order, then it first of all would have been so much more stressful. Um, and we also would have had the added pressure of, okay, we're starting to accumulate debt now because we're already in debt from our wedding or from this or whatever we had, you know, whatever choices we made. And now we're taking on more debt because we're paying for 
therapy and, and anything he needed, you know. And so I went on this journey to find happiness to study happiness, to figure out how I could be happy and how my husband could be happy again. Uh, and then I wrote this book based on everything that I learned from that time. And it became my survival guide because uh, my son was born earlier this year, my second son, and my husband became ill again. And because I had written this book, because I tried to follow my own advice, I had prepared our finances in a way that would weather a maternity leave. Again, I was preparing my finances thinking, well, I have to save all this money because I want to be on mat leave. I'm not going to work for a while. I need to have, you know, this money set aside. And then that time came again where neither of us are, is working and we need money for therapy. We need money for all sorts of things that are important for health. And we had it. And so, and yeah, kids are not cheap. I, I, I can confirm that too. So how do I balance then worrying about the future and planning for the future? So what you just described, I mean, you can anticipate things like a maternity leave. You can anticipate things like losing a job. You can't anticipate things like you know, illness, illness or falling or, or, accidents, or something. Right. And maybe you can't anticipate, you know, losing a job and things like that too. Cause I've worked at Sears for all these years. What are the chances they're <laughs> going to close know. down? Right. And we're filming this just above where Sears used right. to be, I think here in Oshawa. So how do you be, be planning for the future? Cause what you're planning for is the bad time, the financial winter. You're planning for the bad times. Like if, if you win the lottery tomorrow, you don't really need to plan for that. I mean, you're going to end up going bankrupt in four years, as we've already discussed, <laughs> yeah. but you don't need to plan for that. You need to, what you're planning for is the future. We buy life insurance. It's not life insurance. It's death insurance. We don't call it death insurance because nobody would buy it. You know, disability insurance. It's if I get disabled, you know, car accident insurance, all those sort of things. So I, how do you plan for the financial winter without being even more depressed by what you're saving your money for? I think it's thinking about how not depressed you will feel after you've done a little bit of planning and thinking about the tremendous relief and maybe solace that you will have knowing that if something happens, it's okay. We have made choices today that will make the future a little bit better. So how do you plan for it? It is thinking about insurance. Um, seeking out a, a professional if you are overwhelmed by the idea of thinking of insurance and talking to them about, well, these are my needs. I'm really worried about this. I'm worried that if something happens to my husband, uh, he's the breadwinner and uh, what happens if something happens to him? You know, talking about those kinds of things because there is insurance for that purpose, for disability, critical illness insurance. You've got your, as you said, life insurance. The other thing is we talk about the emergency fund. I know a lot of uh, financial experts who say, well, well, what, you know, what's the point of having a large amount of money sitting somewhere where it's not getting, mm -hmm. <laughs> any, mm -hmm. you know, do, not doing the work for you, not getting great interest. Um, but based on my experience, having, I'm not saying, you don't need, a, may, de depending, I'm not saying that everyone needs a year of, of, of expenses somewhere. Um, something, something, one month at least, so that if anything happens, you have some money to float that. And that's not money that's sitting around for you to go on vacation one day because that's a separate fund. Mm -hmm. But something, it's a in case sh crap happens fund um, and not having that touched. Something liquid, something that you can grab right away uh, because you will be so grateful when you need it. But not only that, it will give you a little bit of, of comfort knowing that you are building it even if you don't have it. Start small. Are you saying to put it in Bitcoin? Yes. That's what I thought. Yes, okay. I all want, of it. I wanted to make sure. Every last, that, put make, all of your money Make sure we Bitcoin. clarified what you were, what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. And so, so what you're saying is, okay, stuff's going to happen and you edited yourself there. That was very good. So we can show this video to your son there. So that'll be, that'll be oh, good. Oh, I swear in front of my I'm son. I'm sure you do. And then he goes, mom, <laughs> yeah. that's a bad word. <laughs> At least there's one adult in that house. He's four, but he's an adult. Oh yeah. So stuff is going to happen, but having the cash there okay, you know what? I'm much more likely to be able to to weather the storm. I never have a client come in to say to me, well, you know, I did have 20,000 in an emergency fund and here I am. In a lot of cases, when the financial winter happens, they're already in debt. Well, right. at that point, you're, you're totally pooped. So if you so. have debt right now, one way to prepare for the financial winter, I always say is do what you can to pay down that debt. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. If you get laid off and you have no debt and a hundred thousand bucks in the bank, well, I guess you go to Florida for a month. 
Like, no biggie, right? But if you get laid off and you got a bunch of debt, you've got to find something tomorrow. You've got to keep the cash coming in. So it's a, it's a lot harder, obviously. Absolutely. So. Excellent. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end it. We got to, I think, two of the 47 questions <laughs> I had on my cue card. So, so that's good. The book is called Happy Go Money. Spend smart, save right, and enjoy life. I assume every bookstore has it. It's, it's everywhere. How can people track you down? Where's the best place to stalk you? Twitter, Instagram, what, what is it? Twitter scares me. Mm -hmm. um, so I am most comfortable using Instagram. That's where I connect the most with my community. And uh, I photos, just a nice photo. I know, that's we what talk Instagram about money is. there. Yep. Um, and if anyone wants to find out more information about me, they can go to melissaleong.com. melissaleong.com. And what is Instagram? What's the... Liss Leong. So it's at oh. L-I-S-L-E-O-N-G. There you go. Liss Leong on Instagram. And I'll put a link to that at the bottom of the YouTube video so everyone can find it. And then TV wise, so you're still doing the social then, are you? I am the money expert on CTV's The Social. And that's you're on like every month kind of a thing. Is that how it yep. works? So just watch every show and you'll see you once a month. Eventually be, you will, you'll, you'll see me. You will. Or if you follow me on Instagram, I usually announce that, hey guys, tomorrow we're talking hey, about money. I'm in that building with the car coming out the side of it. That is that's awesome. right. So cool. Melissa, thanks very much for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Doug. Thank you. That was Melissa Leung, Happy Go Money in bookstores now. And that was Debt Free in 30. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. Works for me. The, uh, yeah, there's 57 other questions. Seriously? Yeah. Uh, we, wow. we, we talk about lots of good stuff.